Uh, good morning. Sorry I was distracted. Sharing good information. Uh, this is Gretchen. Uh, she's the technical administrator and facilities in facilities information services at the University of Kentucky. She is going to be the uh, facilitator for this panel discussion, and I'll turn it over to you. All right. Eh, okay, that'll work. So the idea that we're doing here is that I'm going to. Uh, give a short presentation that'll get us kicked off on getting our brains wrapped around a common top the topic of digital archives and then we have a couple of uh, Regney and Lorena have vo volunteered to sit on the panel answer some questions from their experience but this really works best with everybody contributing what they have experienced your questions your solutions and um, those things we this is being recorded so those kind of thoughts even if we don't answer them here those are things that we'll know to research and come up with some solutions and answers we hope so first um, I'm from the University of Kentucky and um, this topic sort of got brought up in my mind from I had attended um, a workshop that was presented by the um, Society of American Archivists. And so our sort of questions that we want to bring up today is exactly what is um, digital preservation and curation um, and how does it apply to university facilities archiving? Um, I have permission to use some of the slides from the workshop I, that I attended and that was their cover slide. And the workshop itself focused mostly on developing programs for digital curation as well as advocacy for financial planning to maintain your sets of um, archives. So basically what is curation or you know, the, the competencies that they addressed were to communicate, um, define roles, strategies, integration, archive, and provide access to your archives. What is curation? It's um, a good collection is curated, which is to say its resources are actively managed during their entire life cycle. And I, in my experience, we are discovering that many of our um, archives were, or our files were archived but they have not been managed, they have not been maintained, and we're running across some file formats that are no longer readable. Um, did a lot of talk about planning, life cycle, and I'm not gonna try to explain this, but that sort of gets <laughs> your idea as to what we, um, some of the things that we discussed in there. Um, trusted digital repositories, um, I'm going to go through really quickly through a section of slides the, where the industry, as far as um, digital archiving, not necessarily facilities, but where the digital archiving libraries is going for being compliant and certified. So you have your, your trusted repositories, and they have designed an audit for um, libraries to do and the requirements that you should do during an audit. The principles for being a trusted um, repository, and they have 10 sets of principles. And then um, the, within those 10 principles, how, how do they define and how you rank yourself, your numbers, to basically give yourself a grade. And then um, the National Digital Stewardship Alliance. They have levels of preservation very similar to earlier this week we saw um, in the level of development for BIM and those standards. The library side of the world is developing compliance and levels of um, their, what level of digital preservation are you at? Um, a 
as far as the University of Kentucky, we are very early in our stages. We are just now, you know, even though we have an established library that people can access digitally, we haven't really gone through the audit, full audit process, and we don't have a plan for maintaining readable files into the future. Um, so this is not just about developing a plan, doing the work, but also developing, um, sustaining the funding and maintaining it. Um, here's a series, uh, there are a lot of organizations working on these standards and coming up with core competencies. And um, after this, I have, I'm just gonna slip, flip through a lot of slides that are um, more resources. We have um, Power is a resource that has a lot of workshops. Um, digital preservation management. So that's basically my background to where the, what we want to, what I'm hoping to discuss in here. And um, so from here, the questions that we're gonna present are, what records retention laws apply to your area? Each state has their own laws and many um, universities add additional laws or um, recommendations on top of the state laws. So what laws are impacting your areas? What does a preservation plan involve? What are the common issues that your areas are experiencing? What funding solutions have you come up with? Um, and what other resources have you come up with, just non-monetary resources? Um, so, has anybody here come up with a preservation plan? You, you want to speak to it? Let me see if I can get this out. So I, we've never really called it the plan, but we um, we make sure everything that goes into our archives area is PDFA now, so PDF archivable, searchable. Um, we run the PDFA program, and it you know strips out any I don't know hyperlinks or um, text that is not gonna stand the test of time and. Uh, before PDFA was a thing, we had TIFF, so we still have some TIFF files, but now we're finding people can't open those, even though they were supposed to be forever. So, um, so yeah, we convert everything to a PDFA before we put it in archive area, just because we want people to be able to open them. So I guess that's our plan. And I will say that Kendra works at Michigan State University with me, and what she's talking about when she says in the area is our document management system that we put all of our, our documents in. And in our document management area, we do have a specific place that we call our archive area, and that's what she's talking about for PDFA. So we go through process to PDFA all of those documents for long-term archivable purposes. And then we also have an operational area where you'll have your native files and we we today don't have any retention schedule for that by planning that because the users of those documents may want to use them in a few years to come so we don't really have any retention schedule set for that because right now today we're not um, putting any like um, personnel human resources type documents or those kinds of documents that m might have the need for a retention schedule. Worked with our um, university archives in conjunction with this plan to make sure that that's what we, we were doing and they were very happy with that and want to kind of follow along with what we're doing and, um, and, and that, those types of things. So at Ohio State, um, as far as we have a university archivist who gives us the records retention schedule. Um, with me, with the archives, I have archive projects, which is a module within SIMS, 
our software space information management system. So the building drawings are historical data, so they are kept forever. We never throw those away. The paper doc, so all of the original building plans, they're all score, uh, stored off site. So I have plans dating back to 1898 up to like, I think April of 2018. But also in the last couple of years, I really expect and require uh, digital submittal of the project uh, documents. So PDF, AutoCAD, Revit, as long as, um, if it's above $4 million, then it's, it's uh, BIM based. So the paper documents, if it's like in the old, the older projects, sometimes we will get paper documents, not the original linen or vellum or, um, but if it was paper like prints, we would scan them and then those are actually, I have a contract with a shredding company. So those are actually shredded on site. We don't have them take the drawings off site. Um, but any original documentation is all kept forever. The electronic files we do keep forever. What, we used to get CDs, now everything is um, uploaded to box. So prior to that, the CDs, again, once we copy the CDs, and I do, um, we have one place where we copy all the original data from all of our AEs, that, so the raw data is kept. We open the files, rename them, and those are also saved on the network. Once we have that um, saved, the original data, the CDs are also shredded. So we don't keep those. But the electronic files are um, backed up nightly and weekly on our server. So that's how we keep, that's our records retention for that. Any other universities? I'm curious how you do your building plans. And if you could introduce yourself as well. Thank you. Uh, Jim Nelson uh, with Harvard University. Uh, I'm going to maybe work backwards a little bit. Uh, where we have focused is on uh, one of the places we focus is on long-term preservation of the dig digital item. So we actually partner with our library and use their digital repository as the safe in which we put our, and we use TIFFs still, um, where we put our content. So they're responsible and, and they, they've committed to preserving TIFFs. So in some ways we don't have to worry about it. We just make sure we've entered our TIFFs into their system, and they take care of the preservation. We, we pay the libraries for the service, uh, but it's a way of leveraging a service that already exists on campus and takes a lot, of, a lot of pressure off of us of how many external drives do we need to make sure that we have plenty of backups, or are we using the Amazon Cloud plus this, plus this, plus this in order to feel secure in how we've stored our digital content. Um, so that's. And, and we have standardized still on TIFF in terms of uh, our digital digital items for our construction drawings. So I, I should clarify that this is not documents with uh, read a lot of readable text that I'm, I'm talking about processing. Um, we do use PDFA in terms of anything that does have readable text in it. We do standardize on that as well. Uh, but I don't think at this time that we're putting them in the uh, central repository, long-term uh, digital repository. Uh, what else can I say about our preservation plan? Uh, something I, just to bring it up is in terms of laws and what we have to retain. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, the legal document is still a piece of paper. So we're still, we still from a risk perspective receive paper copies, signed, stamped, as our le to mitigate risk as the legal document. And this is one of the things we're challenged with is, I know a few other universities in Massachusetts no longer bother taking the paper and wondering if maybe we could do the same. But from a legal perspective, our legal department says, we really want that piece of paper at the end of the day because that's what holds up in, in the court. Uh, so we're looking for changes in the laws to, to help us take a scan or something else to, to, uh, to do that. One last piece is we do have records retention schedules. Our records management office has overarching um, schedules that we have to follow for eliminating either digital or physical materials after a period of time. But really on the facility side, we don't have a lot that needs to be destroyed because for the life of our facility, we keep a lot of these materials. It's really the financial side and, and that we don't handle those materials that we have to destroy things after a period of time.
I have a question. You're talking about keeping the paper documents because of signatures. What if you are you able to keep, for example, the title sheets have signatures or the permit stamps, usually the last sheet of the drawings of the projects have all the, could you just retain those because as far as litigation, those have all the signatures because in between all those other files. I mean, I, it's a good question. I, it, it's one of those things we're investigating right. is, is, is what are our options to kind of stop the avalanche of paper that seems to be happening with well, with the advent of Revit. Yeah. It's like, oh, we'll give you 500 sheets for this. <laughs> well, some of these, I mean, with OSU, like, for example, when they renovated, you know, originally the, the stadium was built with 107 drawings, 18 by 24 in 1922. Right. The renovation in 95 was like 1,800 drawings that were 30 by 42. So they just get larger and larger. The new James Cancer Hospital was like 3,000 files. So when you've yeah. got that many... And they're all 30 by 42 now, they're, you know, they're past yeah. the 24 by 36 size, so. And, and we catalog at an item level, so it's that much more work in order oh. to. Uh, yeah, we're well aware of all that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah. So we open up every single DWG, every single PDF, so. And yep. after, so yeah. yeah. So an interesting thing you brought up, though, even currently, even if it's digital, if it's native digital, you're laws are requiring you to keep paper? It doesn't require us to keep it. That's on the architect to keep the paper. It's advising it's, you. It's from a risk perspective that we want our copy to say, this is, a, this is what we received as, this is what was delivered to us. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's, it, the law doesn't require us to, um, it requires us to retain contracts, but it doesn't require us to retain um, the signed, stamped uh, drawings. Uh, we choose to do that more from a risk perspective to say if, if there's litigation related to a project that we actually have, this is what we received as documentation of what was built. Anybody else have experience in? Okay, so one of the things that we do too is for all of our drawings, our as-built drawings only, we keep those in hard copy too in addition to the digital and we actually require our um, consultants to give those to us on vellum and then we package them in, in huge um, archive boxes and send them to our archives. And we, we do that because it really is those if, if you could not get to those drawings digitally for whatever reason and you needed to pull those back which we've had to do a few times before you you've got those documents in a um, archival way and um, it, we've had we've had to do that a few times before it's not just valuable historically which it is but operationally at the same time oh yes Ken just saying that's because of corrupt files. And, you know, in this digital age, you, you don't know what you don't know yet. So we're, we're taking that um, precaution. So. Okay. Um, we can always come back to this as well. I'm going to move on to one of the next questions. Um, what kind of policies are in place are they written? Are they just common practice? And are they approved? Or is it just, you know, thinking through the whole being compliant, how documented are our compliances? Um, and then issues that your department may be running into with the compliance or the documentation of all of your policies. <laughs> okay. So one of the issues that we run into is we get a big pushback from the consultants to deliver those vellums, but we put that in the contract, so they have to. So that's one of the issues for us. How many um, archivists or people out here today are on the archiving side or working in the facilities library? So we do have some people facing these topics. Um, so other people out here, are we, um, what, 
what facet of the whole operations are we on the end of delivering documents? And what are your thoughts as far as being asked to deliver documents? Nobody else? Okay. It's interesting to me. I don't know that I even need that because I okay. have such a big voice, but it's in It's being recorded. Oh. Um, you know, I get exposed probably as much as anybody in the room to what a lot of different people are doing, obviously. And it's just interesting to me how little this topic actually comes up. I mean, they're so focused just on getting their arms around finding stuff um, that the notion of how they're retaining it and how long they're retaining it is just not even in the conversation. Um, I, probably the, the customer Michigan State that is mo the most focused on the notion of doing it in a format that has perpetuity to it, um, you're the only one, quite frankly, that has even had that conversation with me about that. Everybody else is just like trying to get the stuff, <laughs> you know, and trying to organize the stuff. Um, so when I saw this on the schedule, I was like, well, this will be interesting to see how much, <laughs> how much discussion occurs surrounding this subject because it doesn't occur to with me and I'm the consultant helping them with, with this stuff. Anyway, I'm not sure that was valuable, but uh, it just it's intriguing to me. <laughs> So to add on to that, we think of, well, Lorena's probably always thought of it, but before we were digital, we had microfilm and, you know, paper copies and everything all over the place. But we have run into issues. We had a document management system before we had Meridian where everybody could just add whatever native files and this and that. And then after a while, like, who still uses WordPerfect? You know, you try to pull those up, you can't. Really old versions of CAD, maybe not, you know, like Excel, even, you know, from last year to this year, it's always every time I open it, it's, you know, updating to the most current. So you just run into that. And then when we first started scanning and we were doing TIFF and we had these codex scanners with the software and it was great and we, and Microsoft had a, it was called like document imaging was the program. So you'd scan and whenever anybody pulled up a TIFF in the office all throughout in, in this document imaging program, it would pull up just fine. Microsoft stopped making document imaging. All those TIFFs that we had scanned, if they weren't black and white, if they were color or grayscale or a combination, all black. None of them would ever open again. So we had three years worth of scanning thousands upon thousands of documents that we had to pull back the hard copies, rescan, replace because the images could not be saved. Yeah. So we have just been in this situation where we have had to learn from our mistakes or think everything's fine and then it's not, you know, four years down the road, everybody's at their desk going, I can't see any of this stuff anymore. So you have to think about that stuff if you're responsible for keeping this stuff forever and retrieving it for people or or having it for them to get to you know there's nothing worse than when they come back and I can't read that I can't open it I can't you know so what's the point of having a whole bunch of corrupt files in a system that you can't open yeah. so just to introduce my name is Matthew Warren I work for Arc Document Solutions and they're a blueprinting company but we also do a lot of uh, scanning and digitizing and I had a story just uh, someone was sharing that they had done some archiving I think one of the the concerns that you have is that archiving a lot of times the uh, it's kind of you're just keeping it safe you're, you're digitizing it it goes somewhere and it, it may never be accessed again and um, one of the things you have to watch out for is the quality of which the scanning is done and maybe having processes in place where you spot check and you do quality check. Because I think, you know, I heard this one story of something, and I don't know the name of the contractor, but someone was working within the, I think it was the uh, K through 12 public school system of New York State. And it became aware that this, this contractor was doing a ton of business, but the quality was horrible. No one knew uh, because no one was looking. They just kept sticking it in these digital archives and and so you know you're spending tons of money and effort 
and you don't have, it's nothing valuable. So I think this is a great conversation to have because if you're going to take the time to archive it, you know, you need to keep the goal in mind. There's, there needs to be the ability to retrieve it. Maybe not frequently, it might be difficult to retrieve. And I think that was a neat point that you brought up because our company does a lot of hyperlinking and, and connecting to make it easier to get it. But if that causes uh, a change in standards so that you can't retrieve it, I think that's a good point to highlight. So these, this is a good conversation to have. So. Yeah, I know that um, a lot of documents are being linked within, because they'll be delivered digitally, and there'll be links to you know the, the change order or whatever. Um, and we're now receiving those, how are we going to preserve those? And the links are very valuable. That's what our operations people need. But in an archival sense, how is, are those links going to be retainable? So a lot of those um, issues are, I wouldn't call them issues. Um, the, as we know, things are ever changing. So we're beginning to explore and learn how, what we can do with those. So if anybody has experience with that, <laughs> we're you know, open for suggestions with that. Um, a point on the operation stuff. So what we do um, for my archive projects is bas basically what we ideally would be, I would get a record document for every project that was completed. Um, sometimes we'll get the record documents or CD. I mean, they'll send us different stages, including as-builts. I only upload the, uh, the record documents on the archive projects. Now we have a cloud um, on box is where we put all the as built and the own a manual. So all of our operation staff knows if they want as built, if they're available, they can go to the OSU box and look up. And everything is by the project number. So own a manuals and the as built on the archive project site will be the project manuals or specifications, and then the actual record drawings of the project. So they know that they can go to both areas to get that data. I guess I just want to say while you're thinking about that from the operations side, when you think about an operation manual, if you think about how long the life cycle is for that piece of equipment, sometimes 20 years, so you're thinking about putting that document someplace long-term archivable for access for possibly 20 years. So we, ha we do have processes in place to be able to do that when we get a hard copy of a document. we have. Um, a scanner and scanning software that helps us to turn that into PDFA. Another thing to think about, if you're getting a PDF a deliverable from someone, you, you they give it to you in all different kinds of ways. You know, so sometimes password protected, sometimes, so we go through every one of those documents that we know are an archivable, we need to archive that document and we do that quality control, make sure it's PDFA, make sure it's oh, you open it and all of that, because we, you do need to think about the future with that. Well, yeah, think about what were you doing 20 years ago yeah. with that. Right. What were you so, doing 20 years from now? Right. So do you have standards? Like we have actual submittal requirements that we give the A's. So even with the O&Ms, they have to be like this. The PDF drawings cannot be locked. Right. And I mean, when, when the original project comes in, I'm only spot checking. So, which they don't, re they're realizing now that we're going to open up every PDF drawing, every AutoCAD drawing, and then we'll have another team that checks the Revit models, but, mm -hmm. so we do, so they know, they're learning, and there's a lot of back and forth mm -hmm. with the AE, so, because if you're not going to give me good documents now, in three years when you want to renovate that space, you're going to come to me for the record drawings. Well, so there's a reason why we do what we do, so the better documents we get, the better it is for your future projects. Um, so, next questions are funding solutions. Um, I know that, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, um, Jim from Harvard, you're, you guys pay the other library to archive their things. Um, our department, we're, um, FIS itself is recharge. But the library part of it, we do not charge anybody for our services. And so it, it, it's because it's a service to the university, but in some ways it makes it really hard for us to come up with projects, you know, to say we, we need to get 
all of this, I mean, we still have stuff on disks that only live on disks. And we're, we already know that we're not going to be able to read those in a couple of years. The data is deteriorating. But we don't have enough staff or funding to get that off of those disks. Um, so what kind of funding solutions have other universities come up with? Or what, what is your structure for how your library is funded? Um, ah. Well, for us, it has always been, since I've worked there for a long time, um, we get generally funded for our records, what they call records operations, so our archival operation, that has always been there. So we get generally funded for that because it's, it's looked at as a great value to the university. Uh, I can speak to, I'm sure every university is very different in how their finances work and how funding works. At Harvard, uh, the services that we offer, th and it's through a group called our Property Information Resource Center, it's partly funded through what are called core funds, which is just a general fund, I guess. And then another portion is funded through capital projects. So there is a group that collects this sort of a tax on every capital project that occurs and a portion of that money goes to pay for the long-term storage of these materials and the processing of these materials. I know that when we do our floor plans, we get um, all capital projects, they have that as one of their line items is floor plan updates is going to be, we will bill that to that project. And I'm I'm liking the idea of there being a general tax for maintaining the documents for the university's use. Any other? You got, you got me thinking philosophically now. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because one of the biggest problems is that, that any archiving group has is getting the documents from the project side of the house and fighting the battles to do that and the projects are just moving on to the next project and not worrying about how to wrap up the stuff so to speak but it's an interesting notion to have a tax notion and to have some kind of a credit notion for how they do their part in the process I've been because I've been struggling with ways to motivate for organizations to motivate the project side of the house to play nicely if you will it's kind of intriguing a tax and credit mm -hmm. <laughs> completely restructure the industry. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and then we recently ran across a series of a box that, I don't know, got shoved in the back of the library somewhere. And it has floppies. Nobody has a floppy converter. We don't know what's on these disks. We don't know if it's valuable. It might be the information that for we have a handful of buildings where nobody knows where those drawings are. Nobody knows where the as built or the projects in between. Maybe it's on these disks. We don't know. So um, have, does anybody have any resources out there where you can still get a hold of a old, yeah. <laughs> eBay. I'm not sure if it, it was, it, you, I could connect it directly to the computer. And there was a whole bunch of, it just documents, no drawings. So um, you can probably find it on eBay or if I find it, you know, I'll ship it over to you. Oh, <laughs> so. I was gonna say, we have, I have one that Scott Friend, of course, if anybody knows him, he likes to collect things. Um, so I had a whole bunch of floppy disks that somebody retired and just put on my desk. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with these. And they've been sitting there for like two years. And then, and then Scott, oh, I have a floppy disk, Ooh, whatever. Okay. So I had that and I plugged it in and it was all just like random word perfect files and old AutoCAD stuff that, uh, So even if you can 
read the floppy, get, get a device mm -hmm. to read them, are any of the documents on there even readable anymore? No, you, I mean, you can open it in, in Word, but sometimes it doesn't format or convert. And I started, like, spending a lot of my time making it look nice. I was like, what am I doing? Like, this, nobody's, this, we probably had the approved final copy of this, and it's probably on microfilm, and it's probably, you know, whatever. Which, to speak to our microfilm, we ended up having all of our, um, roles converted to digital. We hired a company to do that, so we have all of those digitally, and they're not in our document management system yet because we don't have people to do that, you know, but at least we can get to that information digitally, and then we could get rid of the big microfish machine and, you know, going through the rolls, so, I don't know, but yeah. We, we received, um, advice because we were wanting to get rid of all of the paper and the advice was suggested that perhaps the microfilm is the better long-term storage because it doesn't degrade and it takes up less space and that perhaps we don't need to keep the paper if we have the microfilm. We have to keep the paper, I mean the original documents, that's Oh, issues are um, records retention. So, like the building projects, as far as the original documents, which we have from whatever I, I mean, they're basically in fat files stored off site in a temperature controlled environment. But my question is because one of the steps we did at that time, we had like 35,000 drawings. Now we're like at 200,000 files, I should say. But we did the microfilm, and they, the company came on site, took little photographs, but the quality they were very unreadable. So when we went from the aperture cards to digital, there was a lot of rescanning. So we paid this company and <laughs> it was, yeah. I don't even know why we took, well, you know, funding, you, we couldn't go from the original to digital. So, okay, we'll do the aperture cards. I'm like, what is an aperture card? So I learned that. I mean, so how was your quality when you went from your microfilm to the digital? So um, what we did, we did do the aperture card scanning because we wanted to get something in the system that people could access. But then what did we do? Turned around, took the hard copy, and scanned it in a lot better um, quality. That's what we did. And then we just replaced the bad with the better and that type of thing. So that hard copy came in handy at that time. Yeah, and we've, I mean, the ones which is, we hardly do any scanning now. I mean, we're at like 0.5% scanning but there was a time when we had gone from the microfilm aperture cards to digital. People were complaining, I can't read this file. I'm like, I know. So we were constantly going to the flat file, pulling him. So that whole step was just a waste. We literally ended up rescanning all of those original documents because you can't read them. And then the engineer wants it to scale. You can't print it and then you print it. It's not to scale. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So any other universities have thoughts, things that I didn't bring up here that you want to share or ask? Oh. <laughs> uh, one other thing about the old floppies. Um, at Harvard, we have a lot of IT-related listservs. And you may find there are people on the academic side that are still running an old system because that's what they have to do and they have a floppy drive. So if you, if you have a way of communicating with maybe the academic side of the shop in terms of what they may have for resources, you may find there's a lot there. Um, some other uh, thoughts in terms of resources, uh, while, while I mentioned that we use the university's library system for the long-term preservation of our, our digital materials, uh, we also use our library services for the scanning. And this is for our older materials. Uh, we have a lot of very old blueprints, vellums, tissue paper, and these are, in, 
our group is staffed with with MLS. They, they have library science backgrounds, so they know how to handle the, these older fragile materials as, as we go through the process of scanning them. But we don't have the equipment to actually do, you know, we're not running this through a, a, a drum feed scanner. They're too fragile, uh, and the library system does have a lot of equipment for photographing art, for photographing large format materials. And we find that the quality is superior to going outside often, and we and relatively competitive in our case in terms of finding an outside vendor and keeping the work in house, which is kind of nice. Um, related to digital archives, I, I'm I'm curious. Well, we have a lot of people in the room uh, that are in the same business. Uh, in terms of your clients. Are your clients purely digital? Or are they still looking for the hard? You mentioned your engineer wants something printed to scale. Even though we're work, working in a digital world, how often is it still end of the day the hard copy that your clients are looking for as opposed to um, using their iPad to look at look at what your content is? Is it, for us, as yeah. far as When you say hard copy, you know, switching from our system to going to the flat file, getting a print to digital, the biggest learning curve was the operation staff. They want a hard copy. They want to come to map because we have a scanner in our office. It's a, a scanner plotter. So they know, go to Reginny's office, she'll make you a print. So I had to like force them, no. And now the archive system, well, in a nice way, but you know, it's it's a learning curve. I get it. They're used to walking around with the big copy. Some of the drawings are, if you print them, they're thirty by forty-two. I'm not going to print ten HVAC planes that are thirty by forty-two. It's on the tablet, and the archive projects is now, which is wonderful, is tablet friendly. So they've used it. And when we switched over, my biggest test was if my operation staff is happy, everybody else will be good. And they've been. I mean, I've got, I've received positive feedback, so they know to go in. Now, when you're looking at the details, you know, I can't read HVAC planes and plumbing. I can tell you about architectural, structural, but they know to, you know, you pull it up, you can search it, pull it up, zoom in on it. So it's been a lot more beneficial. So yeah, there, were, it took some time to get away from the hard copies. Exactly the same. <laughs> it's the trades the operation side that they were so used to going into our archive room and pulling down the stick sets while the stick sets were getting just torn apart, you know, the original ones, yeah, because they're thumbing through them and up and down and whatever. And so we scanned and put those in, and then they were really upset about it. They, oh, years they'd come up and just complain about the fact that they couldn't go in there and thumb through it anymore. And so we got in the habit of printing them out for them, but they're getting used to it now and we're going under our, our, our mobile initiative and actually getting them iPads and mobile devices to have out in the field. And honestly, it has to do with age too. I think a lot of, a lot of the guys that are retiring were the ones that wanted the paper and a lot of the younger ones coming in are excited about having it digitally. So it's just a, it's like a learning curve for them and then it's a mixture of people, so we still if you want it on paper, fine. We'll print it out for you. That's that's great. But we're getting that less and less, which is nice. But it took some years to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We've experienced that, too. Most of our, um, now that they can see it, mobile devices out in the field, they much prefer to do that than to have to drop what they're doing and coming back into the in. Um, there are a few people, and especially in the utilities, that really want to be able to come in and see the hard copy. But for the most part, they have their own sets up in their own room, which that's another issue. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, two minutes. Uh, if anybody has any other thoughts. That's okay. <laughs> Since again we're on the digital topic, and th there are groups that look at de uh, AutoCAD drawings and how to do the long-term preservation. I, I, I don't know the archivist groups have have looked at this. Now we have the advent of Revit and how we're dealing with Revit in long-term. And I've seen some great presentations from Ohio State while well, I've been here in terms of 
having a process by which those are being migrated forward every year so that they're staying yes. current with the software, which I think is a great way of thinking about preservation for those materials. But that's my impression is that's their working, your working materials as opposed to maybe something you received that those working materials were derived from. And is there any thinking about preservation of these Revit files? Yeah. Yeah. The answer was. We're still in a phase <laughs> in the not industry of not about. thinking about how to Our preserve. Really. So maybe next year we'll do this topic again and, mm. <laughs> and discuss that. So we've been getting Revit files for a couple of years now from consultants, and as I migrate every year our, to our new version of micro, or, uh, Revit, I upgrade those archive files too. So I'll open those up. I, there's only three of us um, on campus that can access our files, and I'll actually open up and, and go to the next version because we're afraid if I have a version 9, 10, 11 of Revit, we're not sure if that's going to open up in 19. We're not comfortable. So we've been making the effort of going through our archives every year and upgrading to the next flavor. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm John Lorgan. I'm the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So this is like 5% of my job, what I do. I, I would just add that it seems like a problem Autodesk should solve. They're the ones creating it, meaning they should have a crawler that you could just say, go through this entire thing and upgrade all these models. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to sit there and open them all up, it seems to me. If they're going to change the format every year. They ought to give us a way to easily upgrade them every year without humans having to get too involved every time. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. And thanks to my two panelists.